Art hitting safety Jonathan Abram no longer with the Raiders after Las Vegas released the former first round pick Tuesday night. The 27th overall pick in 2019 started the first six games of this season, but then lost his role in the defense playing under 50% of the snaps the past couple of weeks. Now the Raiders have had six first round picks from 2019 to 21 under then GM Mike Mayock and head coach John Gruden. Only defensive lineman Cleland Furl and running back Josh Jacobs remain with the club, although both had their fifth round options uh, declined. Buttoning up on Abram there, the Raiders had been trying to shop him around at the deadline, but failed to execute a trade. Fifth year options, I should say, there is decline. All right, we've got our general managers to get the GM perspective on the Raiders. And we'll talk about the Colts, who they're playing this week here. I've got Rick Spielman and Scott Peel to be joining us here on CBS Sports HQ. Guys, when we take a look, and you guys are, are well-versed in terms of talent scouting and player development, and it doesn't always work out. But, Scott, I'll give you first word here. Uh, how do you view what's happening in Vegas at the moment? Well, it's not totally surprising because I think what happens often is when there's a change of regimes, if a player isn't an outstanding player or doesn't fit the culture of the new leadership, it often doesn't work out. And just because these players don't work out specifically with the Raiders doesn't mean that they're not going to be able to work out elsewhere. And I think player development is a really interesting word. You mentioned that, Tommy, because when you draft players, you hope that they're going to develop. There's not many players that come to this league where you just add water and they grow and it becomes you know, a blooming flower, so to speak. But what happens here is you need to develop players. And player development really has a lot to do, like I said, with the culture that they're in. Not every player fits every culture, and they need different ways of teaching, and they respond in different environments. Uh, Scotty, I refer to that as pixie dust. Everybody wants pixie dust thrown on these guys, and they got instant, uh, <laughs> instant gratification. But we always looked at it as kind of a three-year rule, and especially the higher up the draft picks were. And yeah. You're hoping to see progress year one year two, but year three was a telling whether he's going to be a player or not. And when we did miss, for example, I missed on Laquan Treadwell, we would go back and review what we missed. Was it something that we didn't see on the tape? Was it something from a psychological standpoint, something potentially in the background? Or what was it so we don't make that same mistake again? So if you do make a mistake, sometimes you can make a positive out of that by assessing what you did wrong or what you missed in that player and why he didn't succeed. And hopefully you don't make that same mistake again. Rick, I completely agree. And we had the three year rule as well. And again, you know, what happens sometimes is, and I was a number of a, a member of a number of picks that didn't necessarily work out. And generally it went back to us making the mistake, either not knowing enough about the player, not understanding what, the environment is that the player needs to thrive. But you're right, we always went back and looked at the reasons. And quite honestly, often when that happened was we were so focused on height, weight, speed, tools, right? The physical tools of the player, and we didn't pay enough attention to, or we knew what the makeup of the individual was, and we thought maybe we could change him, maybe that player would mature. So when we made mistakes, again, which was, uh, you know, happens to everybody, it was generally because we didn't have a firm enough grasp of the player's makeup, who they were, how mature they were, and or we were responsible for not providing the right kind of environment for the player to develop. So we know, gentlemen, that the Raiders have been a franchise with lots of turnover. One of the consistent things, at least since he got drafted in 2014, was Derek Carr. That does include a couple of playoff appearances, though he did get hurt in that 2016 season. He's got through so many head coaches with Josh McDaniels being his sixth head coach since he was drafted in 2014. And afterwards, showing some frustration in the Jags game, saying there's a lot I want to say, but I don't want to say it here. When we talk about Josh McDaniels, Vegas is off to a two and six start. Rick, what do you attribute the struggles for Vegas to be? Well, I think you just got to look at the overall uh, perspective of the season so far. I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but I don't believe they played any of their starters in the preseason and they were introducing a new offensive scheme, new defensive scheme, similar to what we saw in Denver. And Denver has had its struggles because they didn't play their starters if at all, in the uh, preseason game under Hackett. I think the other thing you got to look at, too, 
is why the offenses or defense are struggling. They've had seven or three 17 point games that they are leading by 17 points and did not finish. So why are they not finishing games? And a lot of it was also the, uh, the acquisition of uh, Jamal Adams uh, and uh, Devonte Adams, I'm sorry. And why does he only get one catch in the, in the New Orleans game? And then last week you see he has a, like nine catches for 146 yards, two touchdowns in the first half, and only finishing with one catch in the second half. And they had that game one as well. So I think they have to go back internally look at what they're doing. And the other point I would probably try to make is that it is really tough, and I understand this is Josh McDaniel's second stint, but it's really tough to be a head coach, to manage the game, to go to the offensive and defensive side, and also be the play caller. Where Dabo has really uh, uh, excelled was at Kafka's call in the play, so he has a chance to be a true head coach and not have to worry about calling what's the next third down snap going to be. So maybe there's a lot on uh, Josh's plate right now, but I think he's going to have success. It's just going to take uh, longer than what people expected. Rick, I agree. Sometimes expectations can be a very dangerous thing. And Josh went in there with extremely high expectations, not just because he was getting there and changing the culture, but also because of the Devontae Adam, uh, Devonte Adams um, trade. But the other thing that happened is... You know, I've known Josh for a real long time. He's being very hard on himself right now, I'm sure. He hasn't told me that, but I'm certain. I hired Josh when he was done as a GA under Nick Saban. Brian Dayball, who was also a GA under Nick Saban, recommended Josh to me. And I hired Josh in player personnel in 2001. He spent a year in player personnel. So he knows players. He knows personnel evaluation. He knows what he's doing. He's extremely smart. He's incredibly competitive. And I tell you, I know that he's being very hard on himself right now. I hope that he just calms down right now. And I truly hope that he's given the time that he needs to turn this thing around. Because I think he will. If given the time, if given the patience he will do a good job with this football team. There is some talent there. He, again, he needs to get the, not only the talent in there, but the type of players that match his personality and his style of coaching. We just talked a little bit ago about the culture and how different things can be from place to place and how you can develop players. What they have to do is make sure that Dave Ziegler brings in the type of players that match Josh's personality and match the way that he does things. Because if you get players that are outside of what a, is expected from a head coach, no matter what the talent is, if they don't buy into that environment, it's going to be very difficult. But I think if Josh is given some time and some stability is brought to that organization, they will have a chance to be successful in the future. Guys, you know Las Vegas won a lot of those 50-50 coin flip games last year en route to the playoffs, and they're on the other side of those 50-50s now at 2-6, and six, but a chance to get right going against the Colts team. And, of course, there's sort of parallels and intertwines in terms of Josh McDaniels. We know turned down that indie job in 2018. It went to Frank Reich five days later, but this week, Indianapolis firing Frank Reich. In comes, that's a job for, presented by Jiffy Lube, Jeff Saturday, the former player and then had been just spending time with us in the media side up until this week, gentlemen. He comes in with Jim Ursay saying that he expects to right the ship there in Indianapolis. Rick, what are your thoughts for his head coaching debut? I don't know if we have an hour show today or we got to wrap this up here pretty quick, but it sure <laughs> does give <laughs> Pete Prisco a chance to be a finally be a GM that he's always wanted to be. <laughs> Off the set and into the sidelines there. And, and, and we're seeing, look, we're, we're living through nostalgia here, gentlemen. Rick, but seriously, I mean, what are expectations for him? On the sideline. I, 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 to be honest with you, I, I do not know. All I know is he was a good football player. He was very smart, but it's different if you've never done it before. And the one thing that I'm really curious to watch is how quickly he can make in-game decisions, how quickly he can manage the game. And according to Mr. Ursay, he says that he has no fear because he's not going to listen to the analytics and stats people anyway. So it'll be interesting how... Uh, he manages this game. It's different than when you're up front and trying to make an adjustment to a protection that you see because you're identifying the Mike linebacker. 
Now you're responsible for the whole game and the whole team. Hmm. And the other interesting point is they have, I believe, a 30-year-old uh, play caller this week that has never done it before that was sitting as a uh, developmental type coach uh, two years ago. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes as well. Rick, I'm right there with you. I have absolutely no idea what to expect from this because, you know, he was a terrific player. He was an incredible leader. He was all of those things, an unbelievably smart player. But this is different. You know, I know people that become head coaches and become general managers that become leaders at the top of organizations, and they've spent their entire lives and careers preparing for that moment. And Rick, you know this as well as I do. When you get into one of those top two leadership positions, no matter how much experience you have, no matter how much training, no matter how close you've been to the folks that have had to make those decisions, when you sit in that chair, you are hit with decisions and circumstances, stances, situations that you have never had to make a decision on or that you've never been held accountable for. And it's very different when you're sitting in that chair and you have to make those decisions. Because the other thing that's going to be happening with Jeff Saturday on this is not only the outside judgment, but the internal judgment. In terms of the players are going to be looking at him trying to figure out, okay, What's going on here? Is this the right guy? Is this the person to lead? He will be very easy to follow in terms of who he is, his makeup, his energy. All of that will be very easy to follow. The tough part is going to be when he has to make decisions on the clock, on third down, within, you know, within circumstances he's just never had to deal with before. And we know how difficult that can be, Rick. Yeah. And, and I just want to add one quick thing here is, I don't know how fair this situation is to anyone walking into that, especially with that circumstances. And I know, you know, they're going to do, and I would hope they do the right thing with the Rooney room, do a uh, thorough uh, job search and a thorough for their head, next head coach going forward. But I've just put myself in, in, in Jeff Saturday's shoes and it's almost like impossible or what chance does he truly have? And we talked about it a few weeks ago, Steve Wilkes has had coaching experience. Steve Wilkes has been in the league for a long time, has been a coordinator. And we talked about he's going into a really tough situation in Carolina. I just can't imagine. I think this is worse uh, for as great a guy as Jeff Saturday is, probably as smart as he is, the leader he is. To have no experience to draw on during that game is going to be uh, very interesting how he ends up making decisions. A very unique situation. And guys, I know we're talking NFL, but it has a college football feel, almost like a prodigal son coming back mm. to try to revive a program. <laughs> and Jeff Saturday coming in here kind of out of left field. All right, Rick Spielman, Scott Pioli, gentlemen, thank you as always. Midweek here, breaking it down with the GM perspective. Uh, what to remind you about Sunday NFL on CBS, streaming on Paramount Plus. Browns at Dolphins, Broncos at Titans, Texans, Giants. Jags at Chiefs, and of course, we broke down Colts and Raiders. Check them out this Sunday. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.